What do you see in this picture? The vast majority of people see a bird, and they do not see the surrounding plants. If you did not see the plant either, you probably suffer from plant blindness. <laughs> But don't worry, you're not alone. It affects more than 90% of us. Yeah, 90% of humanity is plant blind. But what is it, by the way, plant blindness? It's a cognitive bias discovered by scientists in the late 90s that makes us not notice plants around us. And this applies to pictures, but also to our everyday lives. In fact, plant blindness does much, <clears throat> does much more than this. It affects our attitude, our knowledge, and general interest. We study less plants, we know less about plants, and we care less about plants. In a nutshell, we do not recognize plants' true value, and we do not realize how amazing and important they are. I'm a molecular biologist, and even though I specialized in plant science, I'm pretty sure when I was a kid, I also suffered from plant blindness, like almost everyone. Nevertheless, I clearly remember I was really intrigued to see how seeds germinate and grow always vertically, or how carnivorous plants can catch an insect. Later, as a student and then as a, remember, as a researcher, I became literally fascinated by these organisms that have to deal with the same constraint as us, reproduction, changing weather conditions, but respond to them so differently. And the more I was trying to understand how plants function, the more I discovered a wonderful universe that showcases ingenuity and even a certain elegance. When I started working in research laboratories, I was really captivated by all the mechanisms, processes or properties of plants. And of course, I wanted to share my enthusiasm with friends and family. But I quickly noticed something. Most people think that plants are simple, if not useless. Even more striking, animals who are always seen as superior to plants, more evolved. But why is this? Most of us consider life with an anthropocentric point of view, meaning that we place human at the center of the world. We like seeing us, Homo sapiens, as a pinnacle of evolution, and we get filled with wonder by any forms of life that act just like us. For instance, dolphins recognizing, <coughs> recognizing themselves in a mirror, or monkeys getting jealous of each other. And within this reference frame, it's absolutely no surprise that plants appear somehow basic. But let me tell you something. This is just a matter of perception. When plants and animals took different paths across evolution, they started evolving separately. It does not mean that animals are better or superior or more evolved than plants. It just means that these two worlds separating long, long time ago and are therefore now very, very different. Let me ask you something. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like from a sequoia's point of view? If these giant trees could see the world the same way as we do? If a sequoia tree could talk, I think it would say something like this. Oh, an apple tree here. Okay, it's a bit short and it loses its leaves in winter, but it's cute, I like it. On the other hand, animals. <whistles> so archaic. They have to move to get their food. Can you believe this? <laughs> What a waste of energy and how primitive. <laughs> If a tree were saying something like this, I think we would just 
be wondering why it is so narrow-minded. And I think this, exa this example highlights very well how subjective our judgment can be on whether species are complex or evolved. So what's my point here? Every species that still exists has shown remarkable capacities to survive, adapt, and prosper on Earth. And that goes also for plants. Think of trees that can make their, flap, their sap flow up to dizzying heights, and this without any heart, no pump. Or the plants adapted themselves to extreme weather conditions, whether it's freezing cold, burning hot, or even super dry environment. Plants can produce their own energy without moving an inch with photosynthesis using only water, light, and CO2. Most plants can also defend themselves against invaders. Because yes, plants do have an immune system, and it's actually quite efficient. And although they have no eyes, no ears, they are very well aware of the surrounding, thanks to a battery of sensors that send them information on light, temperature, water, chemicals, and even gravity. So, plants are sophisticated. Some species push the boundaries of these properties to the extreme sometimes. Let me give you three short examples. In contrast to animals, plants can grow almost indefinitely. This here is Pando, from the state of Utah in the US. And despite what you may think, this is not a forest, but a single tree. It covers more than 400,000 square meters, roughly 60 football pitches. It's made of 47,000 stems, all connected to each other through one common root system. How does it do to expand so much? It uses a process typical for plants called vegetative reproduction. In plain English, it means it multiplies itself. But that's not over. Brace yourself. Pondo is around 10,000 years old. Think about what it means. It is twice older than the Egyptian pyramids. The second incredible plant I want to tell you about today is a skunk cabbage. This plant can produce its own heat thanks to a process called thermogenesis. It can warm up the air in its surrounding up to 30 degrees so that it can, make, it can make its way through a blanket of snow and bloom as early as January. Maybe we'll be using these plants as ecological heaters in the near future, who knows? And finally, did you know that plants can also move? We often do not notice it because they are too slow or the amplitude of the move is too tiny, but the thing is, many plants can move. Think of a carnivorous plant catching their prey, or like this one, mimosa plants. When you touch them, their leaves close up. I think it's such a wonderful experience to feel that the plants react to your presence. And do you know how plants can move? That's true. As animals, we use muscles, right, to move, and Plants have no muscles. What they do instead is emptying and filling up cells with water. And the change of volume of these cells triggers a macroscopic move. So in the end, it works exactly like hydraulic cylinders. And I could go on and on and on with hundreds of amazing plant species with amazing properties. But why does all of this matter? Plants are not only fascinating, they are also essential for us. They capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, provide us with food, produce plenty of molecules that we use as medication, and last but not least, and perhaps the most important for the planet, if you ask me, plants form the cement of our ecosystems and allow biodiversity to sustain and even to blossom. 
Yet, because of our plant blindness, we tend not to care too much about plants disappearing. For instance, two in five plant species are now at risk of extinction. Two in five. I think we all have heard of biodiversity severely declining within mammals or within insects within the last decades. But have you ever heard of plant species disappearing? My guess is probably not, because we don't really study the threat on plants. And even when we do, we think this is of minor importance. One number illustrates very well that this is not of minor importance. On Earth, 80% of the biological mass is made of plants. 80%. And for the comparison, animals make 0.4% of it. So when we talk about biodiversity and life preservation, the first thing we should be talking about is actually plants. And if we were paying more attention, we'd also realize that plants have so much more to offer to us, and in pretty much any sectors. Ecology, medicine, and food, as I just mentioned, but also cosmetics, urbanism, and even space exploration. Take landmines. It's a plague that continues to kill and mutilate people all around the world, and our cure methods to detect the remaining landmines are actually quite slow. But plant biotechnology could change that. Scientists created a plant variety that changes color when it detects chemicals released by landmines in the ground. So we could, we could then speed up the process of detecting remaining landmines by dropping seeds over a large surface. Another surprising application of plant biology, we can make electricity with plants, using them somehow as solar panels. This is called biophotovoltaic. I'll let you imagine how cities could look like if we could use plants to power urban lights, or let's dream bigger, entire buildings. And even without going too far into technologies, plants has so much more to offer to us. For instance, removing pollution from the air or from the soil, cooling down cities, isolating noise along big avenues. Perhaps the most relevant studies showed that seeing plants has a positive impact on a mood. The more we see plants, the better we feel. So, I think this is such a pity we're missing out on all of this just because of our plant blindness. So, the question is, what can we do to change the perception we have of plants? First, studies showed that the more we are surrounded by plants, the more we notice them. So it is crucial to bring people, to bring plants into our cities, into our lives, and into our homes. Second, plant blindness is nothing else than a cognitive bias. And do you know how to attenuate any cognitive bias? By simply being aware of it. It's like you do not see magic the same way once you know the trick behind it. So the more we talk about plants and plant blindness, the more the perception we have of plants will change, and the more we will start appreciating their presence, their elegance, and their value. Take a look at this picture again. Do you still see a bird only? Or do you now see a palm tree and its vibrant green color? But how about uh, pushing this even further and challenge yourself. From time to time, take a minute, look around and ask yourself, have I noticed the plant around me? Even better, ask this question to the people that are with you at this moment and engage in a conversation 
about how beautiful, amazing, and important plants are. Surely, I am not the first one talking about plant blindness, and I really hope, now that you've listened to me, that I won't be the last one. Thank you.